Um, so I'm really, I'm really glad that I'm here today. I know a lot of you already, um, but uh, I, uh, I wrote down a few things to help me along, just in case I have a senior moment and wander off somewhere where I'm not supposed to go. So, <laughs> so uh, I have to say I feel at home here, and I know quite a few already. Uh, I know a few of you already, so I'm looking forward to getting to know, to know even more of you. And at least I'm not confronting uh, some major corporation or sitting down somewhere chained to something or someone. But I am feeling a bit nervous because I know you already know a great deal about the environment, about sustainability, uh, and you wouldn't be here if you didn't care. So I hope I'm not going to be preaching to the converted and that I can add something to this Green Events and Innovations Conference. So a bit about me and where I came from. I guess I belong to about four different tribes in my life. I call them tribes because I think that's what we identify when we go to festivals. You say, oh, look, they're all like goths or they're all, uh, they're all punks or whatever. So um, I belong to about four. And the first was uh, in my youth was when I was hanging around the jazz clubs and coffee bars in Cheltenham. I was probably called a beatnik then. Uh, and I was in a gang. There's always a gang, isn't there? And I played guitars and... And we sang and we travelled around Europe in a beat-up van. And then I moved to London. And again, I found myself hanging around the great clubs in Wardour and Carnaby Street. The Wag, the Marquis, the Flamingo. And I was a mod then. <clears throat> and we'd go chasing off to Clacton and Margate on our scooters. Always Lambrettes, never Vespers. And I've actually still got a Lambretta myself. And then something stirred in Notting Hill Gate. And I moved into Portobello Road. I tuned in, turned on, and I dropped out. Well, not quite. Yes, we were hippies, but we were more the kind of West Coast variety of Crosby, Stills and Nash and the Grateful Dead. And this is where it all really kicked off and my festival life began. But that's, that's what's brought me here today. And today is, uh, I work for Greenpeace, where I manage the event team. And that covers a multitude of activities. Last week, I went to a creative brainstorm about HS2, and I learned some incredible things that I didn't know. You were there? Yeah. Oh, it's just amazing. I just, I, I couldn't believe some of the things I was hearing, and I don't think a lot of people know what's going on with that. Whoops, I'm falling down. <laughs> um, for instance, I learned that the train that they're planning goes 250 miles an hour, and the reason, it, it, because it does that, it's got to go in a straight line. So when they were planning the route, they didn't care what it was going to go through. It just had to go in a straight line. It's incredible. So it's, gone, it's planned to go through some of the most amazing, sensitive sites and special sites of interest without, without, a, without a care, really. Um, and also, I think they were planning, I think, when, it, when it's an operation, it's going to plan, like, 30 trains to Birmingham, which is incredible. There's already, no, 18 to Birmingham. I said, there's 30 already go, so who on earth is going to be going on it? I just don't know. And the costs and everything else, it's incredible. So, so make it, it, it is something that's coming back now. It's not a done deal, so make it your... Get, get involved in it if you can. Just check it out. You'll be amazed at sort of what's been going on. Uh, anyway, but this, uh, this week I'll be doing something tomorrow on International Women's Day, right? And when people ask me how are things at Greenpeace, I'm likely to say, well, it's okay, although it often feels like we're clinging to the wreckage, and sometimes we are. So it can be quite grim at Greenpeace some days, but we work for change. We constantly look for positive solutions. And yes, the optimism of the action is much more valuable than the pessimism of the thought. So if, if you were to check out our website on any, any, any given day around the 26 Greenpeace offices and the 55 countries in which we operate, you would probably be stunned by just how much is happening in our world today, and it's invariably bad news. <clears throat> just last week, two sisters, one age 12 and the other age 14, walked into our offices to talk to us about plastics, and they gave me hope. They were so concerned about the amount of plastic being discarded everywhere that they wanted to do something about it, so they set up Kids Against Plastic. One of their aims is to pick up 100,000 pieces of plastics, and they're over halfway to reaching that total. So they went out in their area and they visited the local cafes and pubs and restaurants, and they conducted a survey. So picture this, you've got these two fairly innocent-looking kids standing there interviewing the owners, the proprietors, and they're asking them, you know, what, what they've got in terms of plastics, what they use, what they're doing. And then they say, well, you're not very good, are you? So we're not going to give you one of our award certificates. And we're not going to give you one of our stickers unless you improve all that. And, uh, and it's spreading. It's spreading through schools. And it's amazing. And they've been asked to do a proper TED talk. And that, to me, that was amazing. Um, have they watched Planet Earth? Gosh, who watched Planet Earth? Wasn't that amazing? 17 million people watched Planet Earth. Unbelievable. Uh, and they gasp, and they saw those islands of plastic and they, the harm that it's causing. So it's given me hope. They gave up their leisure time, their play time, to do something they cared about. And they're worried about the legacy that's being created. And it's not, it's not in their name, and it's also not the only legacy that we're creating today for our kids. 
the plastics are a blight, and it's only now that people are beginning to realise what a monster problem we've created. Even when we thought it was cool to buy fleeces and everything made from recycled plastics, because we thought that that was good, we now, we've now found that the microbeads in them, plastic microbeads from them and other products, are in the water coming out of our washing machines and being found in fish and birds throughout our oceans. Isn't that amazing? So single-use plastic bottles have been in the news a lot recently. Glastonbury have just announced that they're banning them in 20, 2019. <coughs> that would be very interesting. <laughs> so plastics has concerned Greenpeace for years now, and we launched a campaign last year against Coca-Cola. We chose them as the brand leader and the biggest producer of single-use plastic that's not so fantastic. They produce 110 billion single-use plastic bottles every year and admit that currently only 7% of these get recycled. After huge international pressure recently, they have said that they would, could recycle 50%, but not until 2030. That figure also includes the ones that they currently recycle, which they say are pet, from PET. 12 million plans of, of plastics get dumped into our oceans every year, and it's estimated that 16 million tons of plastics aren't recycled. And now we can't export all our crap to China anymore. They don't want it. They've got enough of their own. One day it said that there could be more plastics in the sea than fish, and now we find out that there's even plastic in our tea bags. Can you believe that? That's just kind of nothing sacred. <laughs> The good news is that you'll like to see a deposit return scheme soon where you pay a bit more on your purchase and get it back when you bring it back. And this already exists in other European countries and it could come into effect in parts of the UK, in fact all of the UK with a bit of luck later this year. This alone could increase recycling rates of plastic bottles by 96%. But we've still got a long way to go on all the food wraps, the supermarket packaging, although Iceland and Co-op recently made a big move towards that and I think in Europe I think we've seen the first plastics free supermarket uh, thing opened anyway that's that's the way I hope hopefully it's going but there's a lot more work to go and this week Greenpeace will publish the results of an eight-week survey that it recently completed documenting and exposing the impact of marine plastics around the coast and the islands of northern Scotland and it won't make very pretty reading but let's talk some more about the kids the amazing kids and and I hope for the future a little story I remember well, it was during the Stop the War protest in London, and while Greenpeace climbers hung off the face of Big Ben, quite literally with a banner saying, Time for Truth, we, not for the first time, had blocked Whitehall. And quite a lot of the school kids had come out, I don't know if you remember, they played through it and they came out on the march, uh, and uh, the traffic in Whitehall was brought to a, a standstill by us sort of blocking it. But uh, slowly and gradually, a, a few cars sort of started to manage their way through. And I was literally surrounded by these kids that had taken a day off school. And this car, particular car, came very slowly through the traffic. And it stopped just by us and was with these kids. And it drove the window down. And it sort of looked at these kids and said, why don't you get a fucking job? <laughs> and, the, and the kids looked at them and said, because we're still at school. And, and I could watch the driver disappearing into his seat. I thought, yeah, great. <laughs> And it was still living with the consequences of that dreadful war. And it demonised Tony Blair and war continues to undermine one of our core values, that of a peaceful planet. And one of the first things that got me involved in campaigning for human rights and the environment was when I was involved in collectively what was known as the underground press. I don't know if there's anybody here who was involved or knows all about that. It's way back. But anyway, it was a pretty anarchic collection of newspapers, magazines and comics relishing what was with what we called the free press then. And one of those magazines, Oz, which was run by uh, an Australian, Richard Neville, hence the name Oz, gave over an issue to the school kids of Holland Park Comprehensive. And they, they being school kids and somewhat progressive, or at least their parents were, I remember, produced a magazine of some notoriety. You know what kids do when they're let loose. I mean, there was some amazing stuff in there, but it was like, whoa. <laughs> but the, the authorities came down really heavy on the publishers, and they charged three of them with conspiracy to corrupt public morals. And it was an archaic charge which in theory carried a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. So, phew, that was heavy. The trial took place at the Old Bailey. They were defended by John Mortimer. He, the QC, who created Rumpel of the Bailey and went off and did a, an, and other amazing things. And he called a string of celebrity witnesses in defence, included John Peel. Mick Jagger and John Lennon joined us in, on the defence fund uh, and su supported it. And the three were found guilty um, by a very biased and right-wing judge, Judge Argyle, who made so many mistakes in gaining their conviction that they actually got off on appeal. I'm telling you this not just because I was there, but it set the background in a way for what was to follow. 
and what was happening in the country. Um, the war in Vietnam was raging and so were the protests. 300 arrests outside the American embassy in Grosvenor Square. Black liberation, women's liberation, gay liberation, they were all taking off. The liberation movement was tearing down the walls and that's what the Oz trial was partly about, freedom of speech and in defense of art and literature. And it's amazing to think that back then you had to get your play signed off by the Lord Chancellor if you wanted to stage it publicly. That's so how bad it was and it's really not that long ago. But thank God the carnival came to Notting Hill and it was brilliant. Fest and festivals that we know and love began to flourish. These included the Windsor Free Festival, the Isle of Wight, which is the year after Woodstock, alongside with the more commercial ones like Reading. Yes, can you believe Reading really started in the 60s? Oh, that amazed me, actually. But then a wonderful <laughs> convergence happened. Greenpeace started, and so did Glastonbury, and I was there from right from the beginning. So after a spell of showing people how to protest and org organising benefit concerts, I went off to work at the only survival of the underground press, Time Out magazine, it was, it was really radical in those days. In fact, Mick, Jag Mick Jagger once said that in reading it, you had to uh, cross a picket line to get to the entertainment bit. So I, I produced many of the, my first big events when I was there, including a festival or two. One of these was a festival of street entertainers in Covent Garden. The, um, if you remember, Covent Garden used to be a really bustling fruit and veg market before it was moved to the east. And it left this big desolate hole in the centre of London where nothing happened, whereas before it was full of pubs and restaurants all night long. It was just a brilliant place. <clears throat> and would you believe that at the time that they moved out, they, they were the, the, the uh, developers wanted to actually knock it down. They, and, and the GLC stepped in, thank God, Ken Livingstone, and they wanted to, to preserve and protect it, but it was a pretty sad place and it took ages to work out what to do. So Alternative Arts was uh, asked to come in and sponsored by the GLC and they set up uh, a whole thing around the area with gardens, community gardens, and they encouraged and brought in, we called them street entertainers then because I really, they didn't want to be called buskers. Um, street entertainers sounded a bit better. Busking had a, a bit of a sort of connotation to it. So anyway, they, uh, Alternative Arts with Time Out, we set up the Festival of Street Entertainers and the whole place was filled with street entertainers and that's all there today and we took them to Dublin to set it up there. We went to New York and did the thing with the Village Voice there and it was, it was a really bright place and in fact I think somebody might be here, Lisa, who runs um, Loud uh, a Music thing where they in fact still today audition, it's called Sounding Music, sorry, and uh, I think she might be at the other event here but she basically auditions all the people you see down the tubes and they, they cost me a fortune because I can't really go past them without giving them something because it's in my DNA now, street entertainers. Well, there we are. That was one thing. And I also ran the sponsorship side of, uh, of Time Out. And one day people arrived from, Glass, uh, from um, Greenpeace and they asked me if I could help them. They needed publicity, they needed help. And in those days they really did need help because the whales were being slaughtered in their hundreds, if not thousands. And that's when I first got involved with Greenpeace. Greenpeace had started in a more peaceful way. <clears throat> Not. <clears throat> it started with a benefit concert in 1971, way back, and it was given by Joni Mitchell, <clears throat> James Taylor and Phil Oakes, who's no longer with us, an amazing musician. And it was uh, a concert they put on to raise the money to put the fuel in the first boat that hold, held a group of activists who'd got hold of this boat to sail into Amchitka, an island off Alaska, to try and stop a US nuclear weapons test. And that's the first thing that Greenpeace ever did. And prior to all this, the environment didn't feature very high on anyone's agenda. <coughs> Excuse me. A decade earlier, Rachel Carson had published The Silent Spring. It was all about the devastating effects that DDT, a pesticide, or, or the massive use of this pesticide, was having on the environment, and it shocked America to the core. And it sowed the seeds of the modern environment movement a decade later, the movement that we know today. Back in the UK, the government were getting increasingly concerned about these large gatherings of unwashed people listening to loud music, <laughs> taking drugs and having a good time. Sound familiar? <laughs> so what they did is they commissioned an inquiry. It was headed by Peter Melcher, junior government, government mini, labour minister at the time. But what they didn't know is that Peter actually liked festivals. So far from damning them, he wrote up the pop code, which is actually still in force today. And he wrote it in a way that made it possible for festivals to continue and thrive. I was with Michael Evis a couple of weeks ago, and he, I mentioned that Peter's big birthday was coming up soon, and he said, oh, if you see next time you see him, thank him. He saved festivals, you know, and he really did. Peter told me at the time, he, from then after, he was known as the Minister of Pop. Which is, <laughs> but more importantly, he went on to run Greenpeace, and for many years, he achieved some great campaign victories. You can see, see pictures of him, if you look on the website, of him pulling up GM genetically modified crops, 
where he was arrested with many other Greenpeace volunteers who all stood trial. They put up a strong defence and were all acquitted. And Peter is now policy director at the Soil Association. Soil Association. He runs an organic farm and is passionate about nature. So today we know there are more than 500 festivals in the UK and hundreds more around the world. So having discovered that Greenpeace were out there doing things that actually worked in creating change, I left time out and followed my heart. So my first job at Greenpeace was helping to set up the local group support net, which still exists today all around the country. And it was set up then as a fundraising network, as Greenpeace doesn't take money from companies, corporations or government. It's fairly unique in that it's funded by individuals and by its supporters. And I thank you all of you if you are supporters to Greenpeace. Thank you very much because it's, it's what keeps us going and it's what we need. We used to say, I used to say we had more supporters than the Labour Party and at one stage we did, but I think that's probably changed a little bit with things like momentum and things that have happened in the past few years. So good for Jeremy. Today the local groups are much more of a campaigning force. They're often on the front line, out there lobbying MPs, delivering the campaign objectives on the street and giving talks. Many take part in Greenpeace actions. Some are climbers, some are boat drivers, and yes, some are volunteers at the festivals we go to. But it also spur a thought for our street campaigners, those signing up our new supporters. I think Greenpeace actually started, probably invented the idea of street canvassing, and many charities followed us and still rely on it. And the press, press have tried to destroy these by making, making fun of them. Me, I'd need therapy if I was out in the street the same way as they work. I mean, I just, it's just amazing if you stand and watch them. They just get you know, so much abuse and so much because of what the press has done, calling them chuggers and dreadful things like that. But please let them do their work. And if it's possible, let them work at your festivals. They're lovely people. They're well trained now. And judging by the results of surveys we've done, people don't mind being asked. And it's much more relaxed for them on the on, than on the streets. People don't mind being approached by the AA to save their cars, so why shouldn't we approach them at festivals and think places to save the planet? So coming to Greenpeace from the, world, from the word go, I was on the front line and almost immediately taking part in actions and festivals. I was introduced to the world of non-violent direct action and bearing witness, a Quaker tradition where you simply turn up at a place where an environmental crime is taking place and you bear witness to what's happening there. You let them know that they have been discovered or rather uncovered and that you're shining the spotlight of publicity on them. Sometimes just the hint of taking further action has been enough. It happened with HSBC, it happened with Andrex whose toilet paper was being made from rainforest trees and it happened when we discovered McVitie's were using fish oil in their rich tea biscuits derived from sand eels, the staple diet of puffins off the wee bank in Scotland. And I remember actually more than once being told by the fishermen that we were working with that they were complaining about the seals eating their fish. And I thought, my God, they're complaining about the fish eating their seals. I mean, it, the seals eating their fish, I mean, it's their food. It's, what else are they going to eat? They're going to go to McDonald's. <laughs> Greenpeace core values from the beginning were clean air, fresh water and a peaceful planet, but I also learned a couple of Greenpeace mottos which, met, which were meant to inspire us. The first was whatever it takes, the next actions speak louder. Very useful when you're dragging trucks out of the mud or standing for hours being threatened by Alsatians, mounted police or overzealous security guards. I also learned fairly early on that after you'd been arrested, you, you felt relieved because you'd probably got up very early that morning, you'd had very little sleep on the build up to it and it meant you could finally get some kip in the police cell. Greenpeace always owns up and takes responsibility for anything it does. We never hide, we never run away, and we always say who we are and why we're doing what we do, and we suffer the consequences. And an action only comes after many other attempts to address an issue have been exhausted. So my initial fundraising role meant coming up with imaginative events, and soon I was staging big public events as well as helping the campaigns get noticed. And the Greenpeace events unit, which we head up, was born. And someone once commented that my work was like opera, it's loud, colourful, noisy and visible from a great distance. Hence the use of huge props and huge costumes, often of species that are threatened. And they've included puffins, fish, polar bears, orangutans and flocks of giant chickens like the ones that we took to McDonald's when we discovered that their chickens were being fed on the soya grown in clear-cut areas of the Amazon rainforest. And I also wanted to bring a bit of humour and satire into our actions as we were often venturing into dangerous territory. Sellafield was one of those, the home of the world's first nuclear power station, and it was definitely in this category. They had guns. So Thorpe, a new pr reprocessing plant to reprocess irradiated nuclear fuel, was being constructed there when Greenpeace invaded the site. Knowing it was going to be challenging, 
a large number of our actors were dressed as various outsized characters from The Simpsons. We had Homer, Maggie, Bart, Lisa, and of course Mr. Burns, plus a few donuts and two-headed fish. I broke in carrying this large ghetto blaster blaring out the theme tune, and much to our surprise and to theirs, we occupied the building under construction with little or no resistance apart from having my ghetto blaster wrenched off, my, wrenched off me and never to be seen again. Our action highlighted just how vulnerable our nuclear power stations are. We could have been terrorists, and the madness continues. Hinkley Point in Somerset is currently under construction, a joint Chinese-French venture that has already seen costs escalate to 20 billion, and they've been given assurances that amounts to a government subsidy of a fixed price they can charge that's way more expensive than either gas or renewables and will cost 30 billion over its 25-year lifetime. That's if it ever gets finished. Not a single one of these European pressurised reactors operates anywhere in the world. Costs have overrun at the Flaxmerville nuclear plant in France, which is six years behind schedule. And in Finland, where another EPR is planned, the picture is even worse. The reactor there is nearly a decade behind schedule and three times over budget. And some experts say that none of it's using today's best available nuclear technology, and they still haven't worked out how to get rid of it all, of all the nuclear waste, in fact, that already exists. Another legacy issue for generations to come. And just look how far we've come with renewable energy, and, and don't listen to the critics when they say it doesn't work when the wind doesn't blow or when the sun don't shine. Because we've got inter interconnectors now, cables running under the sea and all over Europe. So when it's not sunny or windy here, but sunny, in, say, in Spain, we can borrow some power from them and vice versa. We live in one of the windiest places in Europe and could generate enough offshore wind power alone to satisfy the needs of the entire country. Last year, Germany saw a day when renewables delivered more than 50% of its energy requirements. So it's happened. We've reached a tipping point and it will have consequences for the entire fossil fuel industry. So I can't drive anywhere these days without going past or going near to where Greenpeace has done something or where we spent the day in a courtroom or the night in a police cell. But I did have a couple of favourites to tell you about, but I think I'm going to be running short of time. I'm being flash signs. It doesn't feel like I've been that long. But anyway, but there was one memorable one, actually, which was, to, which was to do with the opening by the Queen of Canada House in Trafalgar Square. Uh, we were, we were against the, the logging of the uh, clear-cutting of swathes of the last remaining temperate rainforest on, on Earth, actually, on the Pacific coast of British Columbia. So we got together this squad of well-dressed, well-drilled Canadian mounted police, the good old mounties, and just before the Queen arrived, they marched into in formation through all the police, through all the barricades, past the security, right up to the front door, and they unfurled a scroll and read out a declaration outlining the destruction that was being caused and at that moment, three of our climbers had gone up Nelson's column. They dropped down a banner, not saying God save the Queen, but saying God save Canada's rainforest. And there's an amazing picture in the video of uh, some uh, uniformed ca Canadian official realising that they weren't real mounties and completely <laughs> freaking. <laughs> Another funny one was we, uh, we were um, asked to go into Harris to uh, take some of the mahogany that they were selling out and uh, people would go in there and take it out and take it around to the, the local police station saying, can you arrest Harris because they're selling illegal mahogany, which was really quite funny, really. There was tables coming out and everything saying, return to sender. <laughs> So, I don't know where to go now. I'll go to Glastonbury, where we build a strong campaign, we've built a really strong campaign message over the years. We rebuilt the village of Sipson, threatened with extinction. We built the third run, uh, about the building of the third run at Heathrow. We had a departure lounge and out of control tower, the skeleton of a plane, and some of the locals from the village turned up and burst into tears. They were so sort of moved by it. Luckily, Michael Evers turned up and they were sitting on his lap and they were all cheered up, so that was great. <laughs> So we've turned our field there into the Arctic, covered with snow. We built a giant polar bear. We staged a real snowball flight uh, fight in June. And we built <coughs> uh, the field one year. We turned it into an intercontinental renewable energy grid where we built a 60-foot rocket rooted to the Earth, which is inspired by David Attenborough. <coughs> he just launched the Apollo project and said in 1969, we flew to the moon. We had the knowledge, the resources, the cash, the political will to get there. Why can't we solve climate change? And the rocket had a big slogan on it saying, there is no planet B. And then we put a very scary drop slide on the side of it. So we built trawlers there talking about the uh, overfishing and the threats to the, the ocean and the indigenous species uh, living there. Um, our latest campaign at the moment, we, a couple of weeks ago, we launched uh, the Arctic Sunrise off to the Antarctic 
to lobby for the creation of an ocean sanctuary of 1.8 million square kilometres in the Weddell Sea, making it off limits to industrial fishing trawlers, which have been literally hoovering up vast amounts of krill, <coughs> which is uh, the main food source of so much of the marine life there. And using drones, they just discovered a colony of 1.5 million penguins, which is good news. The bad news is that the Larsen ice shelf, which is a quarter of the size of Wales, has finally broken away and more will follow as climate change continues, causing sea levels to rise. And they also discovered thriving, thriving new coral reefs, which they didn't even know existed there. And the oceans are incredibly important. They flow over nearly three quarters of the planet, and they produce more than half of the oxygen in the atmosphere and absorb the most carbon. How long have I got? Two minutes. OK, well, I, I don't know what happened to my half an hour. I don't think I got there, but anyway. Um, obviously, you're here now to learn an awful lot about what happens at festivals. Um, and I was going to talk to you about uh, electric vehicles turning up there, so you may have to look for um, renewable charging places in your car parks. That would be interesting. Uh, we're talking about, uh, we're, we're, we ourselves are investigating the non-plastic uh, cups and non-plastic uh, beer, beer and coffee cups and things that are re re reusable uh, cups for your water. Um, but basically, uh, you're all doing an amazing job, and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot of things today that are going to help uh, as we go into the future in terms of being sustainable. Um, so in talking about plastics or water or transport, they're all key issues. And please, you know, to big them up when people come to your festivals. Tell them what you're doing. Uh, get them involved. They've come there. I know they've come there for entertainment and a good time, but give them, also give them something that they can take away, that they can remember when they go back home, that maybe they can help do and get involved in, uh, and that they'll understand that, that they can make a change. People can make a change. They can change their minds. They can change their habits. Uh, and hopefully they can make a difference so that uh, when they go home that they'll take just more than just their tents with them. And I know that's hard enough with some of them getting them to do that. And just remember it, so whatever it takes. Thank you.